Hello, and welcome to episode four of the Dark Matter Knits podcast. The theme for this week is without a net. So uh, without a net, for in the case this expression isn't familiar, um, this might just be an American English expression, but it basically means, um, you know, when you're a trapeze artist or somebody walking on a tightrope, you uh, usually have a net underneath just in case you fall. And if you perform without a net, that's much riskier. Right. So without a net basically just means doing anything in a riskier fashion than you might do otherwise. And um, what got me thinking about this this week was the fact that I taught a steaking class. And steaking, in case you've not come across, that is just cutting your knitting. It's when you do color work. It's a lot easier to do color work in the round because it's easier to see. Then you're always looking at the right side and you can always see the color pattern. Um, so if you're making say a color work sweater or cardigan, um, it's a lot easier to just knit the whole thing in a tube like this and then just cut for the cardigan opening at the end and cut the armholes for uh, to put the sleeves in. Now I say easier, but it's also rather fear inducing <laughs> the first time you do it. I just about died the first time I had to steak something. And I, of course I didn't do something small. No, of course I did a sweater, uh, but it's actually really fun to cut your knitting. And so this is what I want to talk about today is those, those times when um, something seems really scary or really out there and, but it's actually really great. And knitting is one of those, one of those places where we should take those risks because it's just knitting. So um, let me talk a little bit about, I'm going to talk about the steaking class a little bit first and um, and then I want to talk a little bit more generally about being brave with our knitting. And um, at the end I'll have a, a technique video like I normally do. Uh, the, the technique this time will be how to cable without a cable needle, how to make cables without actually using a cable needle, which is kind of one of those ultimate without a net sort of techniques. Um, so about the steaking class first. Uh, we made, this was at a Hill Country Weavers, which is one of the local yarn stores where I teach. Um, I have done a number of color work classes there, and one of the people who took that class, took my stranded knitting class. Um, stranded knitting is just Fair Isle, Norwegian sweaters, that kind of thing. Anytime you're using two colors and stranding them across the back like this when you're not using them. Um, so I teach stranded knitting at Hill Country Weavers and uh, one of the students asked if I could teach a steaking class sometime, which I thought was a great idea. Um, but as you can imagine, if steaking is a little bit panic inducing, teaching steaking <laughs> just adds an extra layer of nervousness to the whole enterprise, right? Because I mean, with, with doing steaking on your own stuff, it's like, if I mess up, I'm going to be really sad. Right. And then teaching with teaching steaking, it's like, if I mess up, I am messing up not only my thing, but other people's things, and they came here expecting me to know what I'm doing. Hmm. <laughs> the first time I taught seeking, I thought I was going to die. And, uh, and it wouldn't have been so bad because I you know, purposely picked a small, low stakes project. It was a headband. And the problem was that one of the students emailed me ahead of time and asked if she could bring a sweater that she'd been working on for years to steak in class. She didn't know how to steak. Could she bring this, you know, very meaningful to her, fingering weight, Fair Isle sweater to class and cut it with me, with me, you know, making sure that she didn't do it wrong. And why did I say yes? I don't know. Because I'm, because I wasn't thinking. So I was sweating buckets in that class, you know, just terrified that, I mean, I had prepared for class and I've done steaking before, but I just thought if this goes wrong, she is literally going to murder me. They're all going to take those little short scissors that you use for steaking and they're going to stab me to death right here in the yarn shop. Thankfully that did not happen. <laughs> um, so I didn't let anybody do that this time. 
Uh, and we did this little coffee cozy pattern. This is by Rachel Henry. In fact, I need to email her because she asks you rightly to let her know if you're teaching a class based on her project. Um, but basically you, it's called Steak This Coffee Cozy by Rachel Henry. And um, you just knit this little tube in the round and then you cut it open in this direction and pick up stitches for a little button band. And you know, it's a nice, simple project. It's a good introduction to color work. It's a good introduction to steaking and how to pick up stitches for a button band. Uh, it's a really nice project all the way around. And you know, like I say, if you mess up, it's just a coffee cozy, right? It's not the end of the world. It's no sweater that you've been working on for three years. So um, the class went great. And, uh, but you know, I was anticipating, right? Because this is steaking that people would be a little nervous on the second day of class. The first day we worked on the cozy and I showed them how to do color work. The second day, two weeks later, second day of class, two weeks later, uh, we did the steaking. And, you know, I was seriously thinking about bringing a bottle of tequila to, you know, like let them do a shot before they cut open their knitting. Because people are usually kind of, um, there's always somebody, right, in knitting classes that's just really, like, like, just nervous about trying anything new. We've talked about this before, right? In my first episode, we talked about how adults can be really anxious about trying new techniques. And I think this particularly tends to be true of women that they not only get like uh, anxious about trying something new, but it comes from a lack of, it comes from a place of lacking self-confidence with many women, which always just makes me cry a little inside. Um, so I was anticipating a little of that and I'm explaining how to cut a steak and it's really not, it's really not hard. You, as long as you set it up, right? You set up your little steak, you just cut. It's not really anything complicated, but I showed them how to do it. And I'm look and I'm looking up expecting to have to do kind of the rah, rah speech, like, all right, here we go. We're going to steak. Don't worry. Don't fear. Just cut, cut that first stitch. See how it goes. I look up, they're already cutting. <laughs> and not only that, but one of them's already done. She saw me start and she was like, oh yeah, whatever. And just starts cutting. Okay. <laughs> it was great. I mean, the only reason I was a little disappointed was it's kind of fun to have a little drama in class, but um, so there was no drama, like they were just not going for the drama. But at the same time, it made me really happy because it's nice to see people just go for it, right? It's just yarn, people. It's just a coffee cozy. It's just a sweater. Like, it's... Just try it. It's not... No, nothing... Nobody's going to live or die if... Well, I don't know. Maybe they might. But doubtful that anybody is going to live or die if that... If it gets messed up or if you don't like it. It's okay. I mean, for Pete's sake, I've... There's a, um, a sweater that I knit out of... Uh, or I, I got some silky wool, some of the DK weight silky wool at a stitches one time at a really deep discount. It's a really pretty periwinkle color. And I swear I knit three sweaters out of that silky wool. Didn't like a single one of them. It was so irritating. I don't know what I was, what is, was going wrong. I mean, there was some mismatch between the sweaters that I was knitting and the properties of the yarn. I just, something I wasn't getting about the way that silky wool behaves. And they just looked terrible on me. Um, all three of them. <laughs> and I, at the end, I was just like, you know what? I am done. I'm done with this yarn. I am giving this sweater away to Goodwill. And that's the end of it. And honestly, I wasn't really that heartbroken about it. It's just like, whatever. It's just knitting. All right. So, um, bravery with your knitting. I think this is kind of my my big point here is that I would really just like to see more of it. More people taking risks with their knitting. And I want to show you an example of what, what I mean um, by people who just do some really great stuff with their knitting. Uh, there's a, a woman that I'm friends with on Ravelry. Uh, I'm not actually friends with her in real life. I don't know her at all, but um, I became friends with her mainly because I wanted to see her stuff pop up on my friend activity 
screen um, whenever whenever she finished something. Sorry, my screen just went black all of a sudden. Um, so her name is Frida Kahlo on Ravelry, and you really ought to go check her stuff out because it is amazing. She does this, uh, what's called freeform knitting, which is where instead of, you know, kind of making the typical fabric like you would for a sweater, you just kind of start in one place and maybe you cast on five stitches and you kind of do a motif in this particular direction and maybe you go off in this direction for a while and then you come back and you pick up stitches here and you go off in that direction and you just kind of make a fabric in sort of willy-nilly, well not maybe not willy-nilly, but an unplanned fashion. And um, so this is what she does and she makes these just wild outfits out of her knitting and I want to show so here's one of my favorites it's called the Queen of Transylvania how cool is that okay look I know you would never wear it well maybe you would I don't know and I probably I might I might wear that um but whatever like it doesn't matter it doesn't have to be it doesn't have to be mainstream fashion. That's just, I mean, look at that. That is so cool. And I love that she's looks like, what, she's probably in her 50s? And she is working it. Love that. Um, let me show you one of her. This woman's from Austria, by the way. So some of her, uh, a lot of her pattern or project titles are in German. And um, this one is not, but... I love, I love this one too. And I love her photographs. They are just, just crazy. <laughs> and I don't mean that in a bad way. I love, I love this kind of stuff. Look at this. What is this one called? Um, when Peacocks Party in My Backyard 3. <laughs> Apparently there have been two before this. Isn't that amazing? Um, and one of the things that makes me really sad about this woman is that people make fun of her on Ravelry all the time. Uh, well, okay, I'm exaggerating a bit, but I have, the reason I found out about her in the first place was from somebody mocking her in a Ravelry forum, which, I mean, seriously, how, how impoverished does your imagination have to be? And how small-minded do you have to be to, to mock somebody like this? She, she's making, I mean, I don't care if you wouldn't wear that. I don't care if you think it's ugly. She's doing something new and interesting. Leave her alone. Um, I think she's amazing. So, yeah, I just, I really, you know, you compare that to the way that, uh, again, if you look at, at Ravelry, the way that um, there's such a strong pull toward the mainstream middle, you know, that there are certain kinds of projects, certain kinds of patterns and looks that appear over and over and over again. And they're great looks. You know, I, I love the color affection shawl, Vera Velamaki's pattern. Um, it's a, it's an amazing, a deceptively simple piece of geometric engineering. I, and it's a really great piece that you can knit over and over again. Um, that said, the way that there are bazillions of derivative geometric shawls that have emerged from that is, you know, it's just like, okay, let's try something else, you know? Like, she tried something new. Why don't we do that, too, instead of just trying to ride on those coattails? Um, the way that everybody has to make the owl sweater, I mean, they, or, or something to do with owls. I mean, owls are cute, but... I, I really, it's fine that there's the mainstream middle. I love that owl sweater. It's adorable. Kate Davies does great stuff. Um, but I would also really like to see people just tugging at the, at the boundaries of things more often as well. Um, and I guess that's, I'd like to see both, you know? I mean, it's one of the wonderful things about knitting and crochet is that they are functional arts. So we can have people who do just whacked out crazy stuff like Frida Kahlo, the Frida Kahlo Unravelry, not 
Frida Kahlo, the original artist. Um, but we can have people do stuff like that and really challenge us, challenge ourselves to, um, to do something new with the craft. And at the same time, we can have stuff that is wearable on a daily basis, right? I made it. I was, I'm sorry, nose thing again. Um, when I went to Arkansas Fiber Arts Extravaganza in December, uh, Sally Melville was the, the keynote speaker. And she was talking about how it would be, that we ought to be knitting more gray sweaters, was sort of her point. And by, by which she meant that we, if we look at what we wear, what we actually wear on a daily basis, it's not hats made out of variegated yarn or fingerless gloves that have, um, you know, crazy cabling and bobbling. And but what we t typically tend to wear are the, the equivalent of gray sweater, gray cardigans that are knit in stockinette, fine gauge, plain, the kind of stuff we buy in stores. And that we ought to be knitting more of that stuff. Um, which, I, I mean, I get her point um, that, and, and Sally Melville is one of those people, I, I'm willing to take this message from her because she is somebody who challenges herself constantly and she's been in this business a long time. Um, and it's true that, you know, for instance, when it's cold out and I pull out my coat, which already is like navy blue with green and purple flowers all over it. It's kind of hard. And then I start looking at all the stuff I've knit, like what are the hats and the hat and the scarf and the mitts, mittens that I'm going to wear with this. I really start to look like somebody put me in a knitting cyclone and I came out the other side with like clown barf all over me. Um, so I get her point, you know, that maybe just making a, a, you know, a gray hat and gray mittens and a gray scarf would probably look better. But um, so sure, you know, I think that's one end of the, of the spectrum, the highly functional knitting that isn't even particularly challenging except in so far as it should be well designed and well knit and it should fit well, which is challenge enough. But I also, I really want there to be more of the other end of the spectrum too. Um, a little less of the, the twee and a little more of the crazy. <laughs> it just, it's healthy to have both, honestly. Okay, so I'm trying to look, I'm just looking to see if I've talked about everything I want to talk about. I actually record, this is the second time I'm recording this because the first time I started talking about this, I sounded a little too ranty. So I'm pulling, pulled, pulled back a little bit this time. Um, all right, so what I'm knitting this week, and then I'll do the, the technique thing at the end, like usual. A um, couple of, number of things. For one thing, I finished my, if you remember, I, I made a hat last time out of uh, some hand spun that I, that I made. And I don't believe I had finished both of these last time, but I made some matching fingerless mitts to go with them. I, w I was going to make them mittens, but I was running up, running short of, of yarn. And I'm glad I didn't try to do mittens because I wouldn't have had enough. Oh, look, <laughs> there's an end that I need to weave in. How about that? Uh, anywho, I made some mitts with my hand spun out of Highland Handmaid's fiber. And uh, I made the, the thumbs a little bit put a few too many stitches in the thumbs, but whatever, I don't care. Uh, they're not a pattern, they're just basic mitts. I've knit enough of these to to know basically how to do them. <laughs> Obviously not how big to make the thumbs. Maybe you should have followed a pattern. Whatever. So I'm really happy about these, and in fact, they go nicely with my coat. And they match, so yay, Sally Melville moment. Uh, but they're not gray, so there you go. Um, I also did some more hand spun. This is uh, Dawning Dreams fiber. I've lost the tag. I don't, I, I'm pretty sure this is 100% BFL. Boy, do I have a, uh, do I have a palette that I like or what? <laughs> uh, I really like purple and orange and green together. It's one of my favorite combinations. So 
this was obviously going to come home with me. Uh, I spun most of this at the retreat that I talked about last time, and um, I think I what they get 408 yards of what I believe is a pretty pretty light fingering weight in most places. It tends to you know kind of vary in its <sighs> width. <laughs> why, am I, why am I blanking on the name for that? Um, so that is all spun up, and I'm really looking forward to, to knitting with that. Don't have no idea what I'm going to make with it. Um, so I finished that, and I haven't actually put anything new on the wheel. Going to have to get back on that. Uh, but I've been knitting a lot. So uh, one of the things I've been knitting is this, uh, this hat. This is a Struin by Isolde Teague. And um, it's a really good pattern actually let me show you what it looks like in its finished form sorry let me call that up here it's a it's worked from the top down so you you start up here and as you can probably tell from the fact that my needle is down there and um, and then it's got a, a brim on it so let me get this picture a little bigger uh, you actually cut a little piece of plastic. A number of people who have made it have actually cut a piece of Tupperware, um, like actually taken a, a Tupperware um, container and cut the brim out of that. There's actually a, uh, a template in the pattern that you can use to cut, cut it out. Um, I'm knitting this for my son's basketball coach, who is just such a great guy. Um, he's probably in his early 60s, and um, you know, he's a retired firefighter. He's now a special education teacher at a high school. Uh, he lives by himself. His kids are grown. And um, he volunteers as a basketball coach at the local YMCA. And he's just like Morgan Freeman is going to have to play him in the film of his life, <laughs> which inevitably will be made because he's just one of these great mentors, right? Um, and he's just got a great presence you know he's really he's kind of hard on the kids but in that way that tells you that he really cares about them like he really wants them to be good people so when he he's been my son's coach a couple of times um at the y and uh so i made him a hat last time to thank him and when i when i gave him the hat last the first hat that i gave him he teared up like he actually cried Oh my God, this man is so sweet. So I, uh, he asked me to make him a couple more hats saying, you know, oh, I'll, I'll pay you for them. I'll pay you. No way. I'm making you even, you, I'm not even, you're not even paying me for the supplies, right? Like you're no. Uh, so he, he asked for a hat with a brim and you know, I'm thinking, all right, I'm, you know, I'm picturing him. He's like six foot four, this tall, lanky man. Um, again, his early 60s, African-American guy. I'm thinking, right, like, classic newsboy cap, right? Like, this just sort of seems to fit his look. No, that's not what he wants. I, when I showed him what was available, which actually isn't much, not, not many patterns available on Ravelry that, um, that fit the bill, so to speak, <laughs> uh, this is what he picked. He picked Struan, which really surprised me. But then when I thought about how it would look on him, I was like, oh, yeah, it's a good pick. So I'm mostly, mostly done. Um, this is Cascade. Mm. Why do I never save tags from anything? It's a Cascade. Oh, no, wait, I do have it. I do. I do. Hold the phone. Oh, oh you know what? It's backwards. I'm not even going to show it to you. I forgot to flip the, uh, the thing around. Is Cascade Cloud, which is 70% merino wool, 30% baby alpaca. It's lovely. So lovely. I've never knit with this before, but I don't know if you can see this. It's got this, it's got a cable construction to it. Um, that, so it's actually, it's like a, like a little I cord, which makes it really sprungy, which is perfect for this hat because this hat needs to be really stretchy. Um, so it gives it a lot of, I know it looks really small, but it really, stretches out and it's, it's like a baseball cap it's supposed to fit 
snuggly, right? So um, almost done with this. And he wants two, so I'm going to make him a blue one as well. But I'm going to see how this fits first before I get the yarn for that. Um, the other thing that I've mostly been working on this week is um, something with my friend Heidi's yarn, Undead Yarn. So this is her... Why am I showing you the label? It's backwards. It's Undead Yarn. Uh, she so And she has a podcast by that name as well, Undead Yarn. Um, it's her vampire base. She actually gave me this, which was so sweet. Uh, she's a friend of mine. Um, and it's the Frankenstein color, oh, Frankenstein. I have been saying Frankenstein. I just looked carefully at this. It's Frankenstein, punny. Uh, and it's 80% superwash merino, 20% nylon, 420 yards of a fingering weight. So... This is what it looks like. I have a feeling the camera, oh yeah, the camera is not going to play nice with this yarn. That's a little bit better. It is not day glow, people. This is not a day glow yarn. It is, it's bright, but it is not. There we go. <laughs> Look, <laughs> there's the yarn. That's what it looks like. Uh, let me see if the, what I'm knitting will show up any better little sneak peek of what I'm doing. I'm designing a shawl with it. Oh no, it's just really not. That's a little better. Uh, so I'm designing a shawl with this that will uh, be a pretty simple side to side knit and it's going to have beads along the bottom, little pendant beads. So it'll be this kind of cool gothy sort of, sort of look. Um, so that should be done fairly soon. I will let you know uh, I'll probably be looking for test knitters sometime soon. So if you're interested in that, do let me know. Um, it will use one skein of fingering weight, and I will, um, if you're interested in testing, I'll send you the draft of the pattern so that you can try it out. Um, and is that what I've been... That, I believe, is about what I've been working on for the last couple weeks. All right, I will... Um, oh, I have one announcement to make. So when I was at the retreat uh, in uh, a couple of weeks ago up in Denton, um, I met Brenda, who is one of the organizers of the Magnolia State Fiber Festival. And um, she asked me to pass along the news to you about this event, which is taking place. I'll show this to you, even though it's backwards. It's taking place from May 30th to May 31st in Vicksburg, Mississippi. So if you're anywhere in that area, do check it out. It looks to be a, a really nice um, small show uh, with a market and classes and, um, but you know, not, it's not Ryan Beck where you would just be like, ah, so many people. <laughs> Speaking of introverts. Um, so the, the way to, the place to look for more information is msff.net. So Magnolia State Fiber Festival, msff.net. And I will put a link to all of these things that I talked about in the show notes. Okay, I believe that is it for this week, except for um, hang on for the technique video where I will show you how to cable without a cable needle. Otherwise, I'll see you in a couple of weeks. Okay, Bye. we're going to take a look at how to work a cable without a cable needle. And let me just explain a little bit about, if you haven't worked cables before, how to, um, what, what basically the structure of a cable is. So here, here are a couple of cables. These are cables that involve four stitches. And, um, and really all a cable is, is just working stitches out of order. These stitches would normally be worked first before these, but instead I moved them to the back and worked these first. So you're just basically taking, you know, a number of stitches, in this case it was two and two, and flipping them around and working them out of order. And that's what gives them that twist. So in case you haven't worked cables at all, uh, let me show you how to work a cable with a cable needle, and then I'll show you how to do it without. So this one right here is, um, it's called different things depending on what kind of nomenclature your pattern is using. Um, very often it will be referred to as a C4B cable. And all that means is the C stands for cable. The four is how many stitches are involved. And the B stands for back. And all that means is you take 
uh, the, the initial set of stitches, in this case it's two, hold them to the back. So these are held to the back. Sorry, these are held to the back so that they twist like that. Okay, so let's take a look at what that looks like. That would be the instructions as they would be given to you in a pattern. You, know, you look at a, at a chart and it will tell you how to work a cable with a cable needle. All right, so it'll, it would tell you if you were doing a C4B, here's my cable needle. Um, sometimes they have this shape I'm going to be using this one because it's more appropriate the size of my needles. Um, so I've gotten here to my four stitches that are involved in the cable. And I'm just going to slip those first two stitches onto the cable needle and off of the left hand needle. And I'm going to hold them to the back. So I just need to get my Keep my yarn from getting twisted around there. Okay, so all of that, those two stitches are now in the back. You can see them back here. And now I need to knit these next two stitches. And then you work the two stitches off the cable needle. So I'm actually going to just put those two stitches up at the end of up at the tip of the cable needle and just work them straight off of the cable needle like that okay so that gives you exactly the same cable as I did before uh, sometimes it's also called a two over two slash two RC and that just means two over two stitches right leaning cable. See how it kind of leans to the right. All right, I'm gonna back this up and show you how to work exactly that same cable, but without a cable needle. And for any, just really any cable that is four stitches or fewer, I do it without a cable needle. It's, to my mind, a lot easier, a lot less fiddly than doing it with a cable needle. Okay, so the problem is with doing it without a cable needle is that you've got to have the instructions in your head because patterns are written, most patterns are written assuming that you're using a cable needle. So you're going to have to understand the structure of your cable so that you can see how to do it without a cable needle because the pattern is not going to tell you how to do this typically. All right, so remember that this cable, we need these the two stitches that are on the far side to cross over the front of these first two stitches. So these need to these two stitches in other words the first two need to be in the back and these second set of two stitches need to be in the front. So how am I going to do this? I'm going to grab these two stitches with the tip of my right hand needle And I'm going to let these two, these first two stitches, just sl slip off the needle. And notice with my left, my right, right hand, sorry, I'm pinching at the bottom here so that the, they don't go anywhere. I'm going to let the left hand needle come out of both sets of stitches. So what's happened here is that that set of stitches I grabbed, the right hand needle is on the right hand needle, and those, that, those other two stitches are just floating free down there. And I'm just going to grab them with my left hand needle, rescue them, and then take those two stitches that were on my right hand needle and slip them back to the left. Now look what's happened here. The stitches are now already twisted and now I just need to work them. So I've basically set them up into the correct twist and then you just have to knit them like nor like regular knit stitches. Like that. All right, let's look at how to do the same thing with a cable that's leaning in the other direction. All right, this one is a C4F cable. 
it's four stitches and the when you the first set of stitches you hold to the front with a cable needle so if I were doing this with a cable needle I would slip the first two onto the cable needle hold them to the front work these two and then work the two off the cable needle but I don't want to do that I want to do it without a cable needle so all I have to do is look down below at what needs to happen I can see that this second set of stitches, which I need to grab with my right hand needle, needs to go across the back. The first set of stitches is going to be in the front. So just grab that second set of stitches from the back. See how I'm kind of rotating my work around. Drop that yarn so you can see. Rotating the work around and looking at it from the back slip your right hand needle in there again just kind of let all four stitches come off the left hand needle and insert the left hand needle into the two that are floating free put the stitches on the right hand needle back on the left so you can work them and look they're already twisted ready to go and then you just knit them like normal. And this is really great, especially if you've got a lot of twisted stitches, if you're doing just one over one twists, because who wants to use a cable needle for something like that? There you go. It, I, pro I promise you that this will feel really fiddly at first and, um, and will probably be a bit of a struggle, but if you stick with it, this is a much faster once you get used to it, a much faster technique than using a cable needle. So give it a try.